Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest today is Matthew Bruckner, Associate Professor of Law at Howard University School of Law. We will discuss his scholarship on access to bankruptcy protection for financially distressed institutions of higher education, especially his recent work on bankrupt public colleges. So uh, welcome to the podcast, Matt. Thanks so much for having me, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, my pleasure. And um, I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, your scholarship on this subject because I personally find it really fascinating, kind of troubling, and um, unfortunately also quite quite timely um, as it's a really live issue right right now. So I was wondering if, if you could start uh, by giving listeners who might not have a great deal of familiarity with bankruptcy law in general and specifically bankruptcy law as it relates to organizations as opposed to personal bankruptcy, just kind of explain to people, you know, kind of how bankruptcy for organizations works, what their options are, and sort of what the differences of the different ways that organizations can use bankruptcy protection would would look like. Sure, Brian. So generally speaking, there are two types of bankruptcies that are available for institutions. There are liquidations, which means that uh, the stores or, or the companies uh, um, are going to wind down and end their business. Um, so um, uh, Circuit City, for example, is one of these. Um, a bunch of retail stores have, have gone under um, and uh, have just, just disappeared from the, the landscape. Um, and so for these uh, uh, these types of bankruptcies, often referred to as Chapter 7, um, they are uh, a chance to sort of wind down the operations in an orderly manner. Um, the uh, By contrast, uh, Chapter 11, or the reorganization provisions, are uh, the types of bankruptcies that um, right now um, Sears and Toys R Us are trying to go through they're an attempt to um, to restart the business, to um, often to scale them down a little bit, um, to close unprofitable stores, to uh, to terminate or um, otherwise eliminate um, unprofitable leases and um, other sort of contractual obligations in order to um, to return to a sort of a more uh, smaller but uh, more profitable um, basis of operations. Okay. Okay. So this distinction between chapter seven, where as I take it, the organization or business is going to be liquidated and chapter 11, where the organization is going to reorganize and continue to exist in some form. Is that a choice that's made by the organization or the management of the organization itself uh, or by someone else or by potentially some combination thereof? Yes, yeah, I don't know that you have a particularly international audience, but that would be one of the things that really is a distinguishing feature from U.S. bankruptcy as compared to um, insolvency regimes in other countries, which is that um, in the U.S., the um, the debtor's existing management, um, you know, the ones who who got the entity into trouble in the first place, um, are the ones that remain uh, in control of the organization. Now, there's been a lot of scholarship that suggests that that functionally, that's um, that the existing management gets uh, displaced either immediately prior to the bankruptcy um, because the um, the debtors um, existing lenders um, in order to they often sort of demand um, a say in who runs the company in order to extend some exist some new financing to try and keep the entity out of bankruptcy um, and so they often displace the management beforehand but yes it's the uh, the, the debtors existing managers who um, who make the choice of whether to liquidate or reorganize as you might expect there's a real bias though towards reorganization towards chapter 11 uh, because <clears throat> the existing management um, it will find themselves out of a job if uh, if the company liquidates Right. Are there times when reorganization just isn't an option or where the management can't choose reorganization even if it wants to? Yes. Yeah. So um, Elizabeth Warren, uh, now Senator Warren, um, amongst others, has, has written a paper um, that, um, that talked about the success of Chapter 11 um, 
there was a real concern that a lot of companies were trying to reorganize and were failing to do so, uh, and that we really needed to facilitate the, uh, the movement of companies into liquidation sooner, and we shouldn't maybe allow um, management to try to preserve their jobs at the expense of creditors to spend money uh, in a failed attempt to reorganize. But um, uh, Professor, now Senator Warren's uh, work showed that um, the companies with a realistic chance of reorganizing, uh, and I think the paper was, uh, they defined that as that they put forward a, a, a plan of reorganization um, within maybe the first six months of the, of the bankruptcy case. So th- those who came forward with a plan to reorganize uh, did so at, I forget the exact numbers, maybe 80% of the time, uh, and really sh- suggested that, that there's an effective sorting mechanism in bankruptcy that, um, yes, we allow companies to, um, you know, allegedly to try to reorganize, but basically we give them a chance to put forward a plan to suggest, like, how might we reorganize? Um, and if they can't do so, then they're quickly shunted over to the liquidation provisions. Ah, okay. So in, in practice, it sort of works out that if a company doesn't have a realistic prospect of reorganization, then there are sort of features or structural mechanisms that are going to push them toward liquidation instead, whatever the management wants. That's right. Now, um, that's what the empirical literature suggested, to the best of my knowledge. Um, you know, and one of the things that, that pushes people uh, into liquidation is the lack of money, right? So uh, you need a, you need to sort of as the debtor, you need to pitch your plan of reorganization to uh, to lenders. You need to suggest to them, this is our path forward. Right? We're going to close uh, these unprofitable stores, and we're going to, um, you know, we're going to recenter our business not on this, you know, failed expansion strategy, but we're going to focus on, um, um, you know, some. Some, some different strategy. And then you need to sort of sell people who might lend you money and say, right, this is the strategy um, because a lot of bankrupt entities end up in bankruptcy because they've, they've just run out of money. Uh, so they can't make payroll. Uh, they can't uh, pay their, uh, they can't pay their rent. Um, and while bankruptcy provides some protection uh, from having to pay claims, uh, that protection is not unlimited in, in time. Okay. So just to clarify, do then the creditors have to legally agree to reorganization? Or is it more of a practical issue that if you can't find creditors willing to agree to a reorganization, you're functionally speaking, not going to be able to reorganize? So both. A lot of entities uh, come into bankruptcy needing cash. Uh, And so those who have an immediate need for cash often need to uh, convince a lender, sometimes just the bankruptcy court, uh, but need to convince a lender often to to lend them some additional money so they can um, they can engage in their restructuring process uh, and hopefully uh, save the business. Um, but uh, even for companies that do find a willing lender um, or do convince a court that they can use cash on hand that is otherwise encumbered um, by by liens or, or whatnot, that um, in order to leave bankruptcy, uh, in order to exit, they need to um, have a vote of creditors. So the, the debtor will put forward their plan of reorganization, uh, and at the end of the case, or towards the end of the case, the they will solicit votes on that plan in most instances, um, and um, uh, they need, um, in most cases, they need uh, the creditors, by and large, to, to sign on to that plan. Okay. Okay. So your work, recent work anyway, has focused on bankruptcy protection in relation to institute, uh, institutions of higher education. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how bankruptcy is different for institu- institutions of higher education uh, with re- in regard or in relation to kind of regular business organizations. Is it because they tend to be nonprofit or charitable organizations or are there other features or factors that are um, making the way that bankruptcy protection works different? So I I think, um, you know, in my first article, Bankrupting Higher Education, I talked about the different types of governance structures, the difference between for-profit and non-profit uh, institutions of higher education, um, with, I think, maybe most obviously, uh, for-profit um, institutions of higher education being the most similar to the types of for-profit businesses that we often see uh, using bankruptcy protection. Uh, but nothing stops nonprofit entities think, 
hospitals, firehouses, um, et cetera, um, charitable organizations of any type um, from using Chapter 11 reorganization provisions as well. The most important difference, uh, the reason why colleges um, by and large do not enter into uh, bankruptcy of any sort is that they are uh, automatically and irrevocably terminated from accessing uh, Title IV funds under the Higher Education Act. That's uh, Pell Grants, um, Stafford Loans, um, th those sorts of things, right? And um, you know, most students these days with the price of higher education just can't afford to go to college unless they are getting uh, loans or grants. Um, and uh, the lack of access is what forces colleges to try to reorganize outside of bankruptcy or to, um, um, to, to in general, just avoid bankruptcy altogether. Okay, so let me... Let me try to understand what you're saying here is that if a charitable institution of higher education decides to go into chapter 11 or reorganization bankruptcy, mm -hmm. the students who enroll in that school can't get certain kinds or perhaps any forms of federal student aid. Am I understanding that correctly? That's correct. Wow. Why? Why? Um, there were changes in the 1990s that seemed to have been spurred by concerns about, um, fly by night colleges, um, uh, enrolling a bunch of students, taking their student loan aid, uh, and then, um, seeking refuge in the bankruptcy courts. Um, the idea being, I guess, that, uh, that bankruptcy judges might, um, allow them to, uh, to continue to operate, um, while they continue to, um, get more student loan dollars, um, and returning sort of, um, you know, no, nothing at all to, to students. Um, and, um, there doesn't seem to have been a lot of evidence that this was happening. Um, and as I've argued in my papers that, um, um, uh, bankrupt entities, uh, which are operating right now, or sorry, financially distressed entities that are operating right now outside of bankruptcy are, um, there are allegations that some of them are, um, bad for students, that they are enrolling students in programs that, uh, do not prepare them for the job market. Um, and that, um, they are, uh, these students are racking up all this, um, the student loan debt, which is generally speaking hard to discharge in their own the students' um, cases. Um, and um, so this is happening right now. Um, and so from my perspective, um, if this, this entity that we're, we're doing this right now were to go into bankruptcy, we would add on top of accrediting agencies and on top of state attorney generals, we'd add additional eyesight and additional investigatory powers from the bankruptcy court, from the United States trustees, from creditors who are interested. And so not clear to me why um, sort of removing bankruptcy oversight is uh, was ever supposed to be a solution to the problem of fly-by-night colleges. Right. So you say that that institutes of higher education that go into chapter 11 reorganization no longer have access to, you know, the ability for their students to take out uh, federal aid. And I could see why that would be essentially a death sentence for any institution mm -hmm. that, you know, didn't have a huge endowment to rely on. And of course, if it had a huge endowment, it wouldn't have a bankruptcy problem in in the first place. So if they don't have access to bankruptcy protection, what other options do those institutions have? What do they do instead? Um, generally speaking, they just shut down um, and they liquidate under state law. Um, but, you know, the thing that got me interested in this in the first place was I entered the law teaching market, trying to find my own uh, job as a tenure track professor um, during the uh, downturn in law school enrollments. And a lot of people were talking about uh, all of the law schools that are going to close. And very often, Thomas Jefferson School of Law, a uh, standalone uh, law school with um, uh, in San Diego with um, um, high student debt burdens upon graduation and uh, and uh, not especially good job outcomes for their students um, uh, was often touted as the 
the sort of exemplar of the kind of law school that was going to close in the downturn. Then they defaulted on their bond obligations uh, with their, uh, their new law school building. It was like, all right, this is the moment. This is the school that's going to close. And now this is the moment in which they're going to close. And then they didn't close. And I was, well, I was taken back. And so I, uh, I dug into their financial statements, trying to figure out why didn't this school close and how did it come about? Um, and it turned out that they were, um, you know, outside of their obligations to pay for this new law school building. Um, so, you know, some sort of rent uh, or imputed rent. Um, um, they were producing, in back in 2013 financial statements, they were producing about $11 million a year in, um, in revenue, in profit, you know, uh, in revenue uh, in addition to their cost outside of their rent. Um, and so that's why they didn't close. Um, they had a small group of bondholders that had f- uh, funded the new law school building and um, – um, and getting $11 million a year from the school was better than getting nothing, which is, you know, what, you know, they would have been able to seize the law school building and, and repurpose it. But it was it was a purpose built law school. Mm. Building. It wasn't especially useful as condominiums, um, uh, I guess, um, at, at the time. Um, and so they facilitated a, um, a restructuring outside of court uh, where the bondholders um, um, repossessed the law school building and then rented it back to the law school at a, um, a rate that I suppose the law school thought it was going to be able to pay. Um, when that deal ended, though, I think it was a three-year lease agreement. Um, Thomas Jefferson has since vacated that building um, and now is renting office space, and I think it's in downtown San Diego. But so that's one possibility is that you try to do an out of court restructuring, uh, much easier to do in Thomas Jefferson's case, where your debt is primarily held by uh, held by a few uh, like minded uh, institutional players. Much harder to do if your debt is held at the retail level uh, by you know people like me or you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, how long do you think those kinds of attempts to kind of effectively restructure or reorganize debt outside of bankruptcy tend to last? I mean, are, is there a sense that like some or most or any of these institutions ultimately kind of get out of financial distress and become healthy institutions again? Or is it more a situation where they seem to spend a certain amount of time as kind of like zombie institutions before ultimately closing anyway? I haven't been studying it long enough to to really be able to give a great answer to that question, right? So the you know I've particularly been interested in sort of law schools uh, as a law professor and um, the market um, has just started to turn around uh, for the first time since I joined the academy. Um, you know I I know that um, you know outside of the law school market. Um, um, Colleges have also been struggling, especially small and medium-sized colleges. And it seems like there's been um, an uptick in recent years in college closures, uh, rather than a sort of a leveling off. Now, so I don't know if these are these entities are sort of um, sort of just lingering zombies. A lot of um, well, maybe an example that is. Um, all along as we're saying, um, Sweetbriar College. Um, Sweetbriar College, a couple of years ago, the Board of Trustees thought, um, uh, you know, we're a small liberal arts, liberal arts college in Southwest Virginia, most famous for our equestrian program, um, uh, women's only college, and there's just not uh, demand for our product anymore. Uh, and so they decided, even though they had something like a hundred million dollar endowment still to, um, to close the school and use that endowment to transition everybody um, there was a revolt. Um, the board of trustees was deposed. Uh, a new board was brought in. The uh, state attorney general allowed the college to uh, raid their um, uh, to free up uh, sort of otherwise restricted endowment funds if the school could uh, could match. I think it was sort of sixteen million dollars uh, of the endowment they they pulled and sixteen million dollars in matched funds. Um, and the school saw a um, uptick, at least in the first year, in enrollment. Um, right now, maybe that was just um, because it was high profile and in the news. But I, I also don't think the average 18-year-old is particularly attentive <laughs> to um, uh, the financial distress of, of potential college choices. And so perhaps they just did a better job marketing themselves. Uh, and so that is you 
casino. Um, that is a success story, I think, in terms of a, a you know a non bankruptcy sort of turnaround. Although, you know, it's early still, and, and um, you know, a bumper first year class stays with a college or a law school for a long time. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, a, a tiny first year class um, it takes a long while to uh, to sort of uh, have that lump move through. Um, and so it's not clear yet whether um, this is sort of a sustainable turnaround. Okay. So assuming the counterfactual, uh, a situation where there is no longer this restriction on schools in reorganization having access to to federal funds. Do you think that more schools would choose to reorganize rather than looking for alternatives? And are there things you think the government might consider or ought to do under those circumstances in order to ensure that uh, the availability of reorganization under Chapter 11 isn't abused? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot to that question. Um, so were things to change, some more colleges would attempt to reorganize. Um, we just saw the Education Corporation of America, a for-profit chain that owned um, um, a bunch of campuses, try to use uh, a state law receivership to reorganize. Um, um, they they were very clear that they were trying to use a state law receivership um, because uh, bankruptcy was not available to them. Um, Vatterot College, which um, also just uh, shut down, uh, also tried to use a receivership to restructure. Um, ITT Tech, Corinthian, big for-profit um, colleges would probably try to, to do this, right? They are the most business-like. And so Chapter 11, which is um, often thought of as sort of a business reorganization provision, uh, would probably be of most use to um, to the most business-like of the, of the college, which tend to be sort of larger for-profit sort of uh, education uh, conglomerates. Um some people, therefore, don't like my proposal um, because they think that's um, that's a terrible outcome. That, uh, that that you know, a lot of people uh, think that for-profit colleges are predatory institutions, um, and we could do with less of them. Uh, and so, um, anything that sustains them is um, is not a good option. Um, and um, so, then that gets to right would. Would sort of smaller nonprofit entities also be able to use bankruptcy? Um, I think some would be able to. Um, Burlington College um, up in Vermont, um, I, I think, is, is a good example. Um, they, uh, under the um, presidency of um, Bernie Sanders' wife, Jane Sanders, um, decided that um, they were going to buy a, a much larger um, campus. They were going to sort of buy a sort of prime lakefront Burlington property uh, and radically expand the size of their institution. Um, they were going to do that by uh, increasing fundraising and by increasing enrollment, neither one of which turned out to be uh, an available option to them. Um, so they found themselves over indebted. Uh, and that's very much the kind of thing that bankruptcy can help with. Bankruptcy could have allowed them to shed their excess debt burden uh, and retrench back to sort of a smaller, uh, a smaller footprint, a more sustainable economic model. So I think colleges like Burlington College would also use bankruptcy. Now, to the extent that the bankruptcy isn't, it doesn't fix every problem. So to the extent that, uh, that Sweetbriar ultimately turns out that their former board of trustees was correct and that, uh, that a um, small liberal arts women's only program in Southwest Virginia is not what most students want. Bankruptcy can't drive students to attend. Right? Bankruptcy can uh, can reduce the sort of debt burdens. They can allow companies to restructure their operations, but they're not going to recruit new uh, you know customers. To use the analogy, um, but what also can bankruptcy do in order to uh, what what could policymakers do to to protect? Um, students from 
say, for-profit uh, colleges that were using bankruptcy. Um, um, I, I have a couple of ideas. Um, it's possible that um, – so the default option in a bankruptcy proceeding, as I said earlier, is that the debtor's management remains uh, in control of operations. They choose whether to reorganize or to liquidate. They also continue to control the day-to-day -day operations of the entity. One possibility would be to displace the existing management uh, and bring in some sort of a, uh, a trustee to to run the business um, and with the idea that these folks may be a little bit more um, um, student-centric. Um, another possibility would be to, um, and we see this in the healthcare context, um, in healthcare bankruptcies, there is a, uh, a patient ombudsman. Um, make sure that patient medical records um, are sort of adequately maintained and privacy issues are maintained. It's possible that there could be uh, an analogous, say, um, you know, student ombudsman in, uh, in education bankruptcy cases, for example. Cool. Cool. Okay. So your most recent work has looked at public colleges that find themselves in financial distress and sort of what kinds of options might be available to them. How are the circumstances of public colleges different from private colleges? Uh, so they're different in a lot of ways. I mean, most notably, uh, the um, finances of public colleges are often, though not always, um, closely intertwined with uh, the finances of the state. Now, some states um, have a little bit more separation uh, between their state colleges and uh, and the sort of state treasury, uh, but often they're, um, they're, they're intertwined. Um, um, they're also, there's just a lot less of them, right? So to the extent that um, that not that many colleges or uh, would take advantage of bankruptcy, even fewer public colleges would take advantage of, of bankruptcy just because, um, you know, they're, I think in the last few years, we've seen something like 30 public colleges close or merge or otherwise disappear, right? And that's, that's, um, in contrast to um, something like you know a hundred or more campuses per year in the private uh, the private side, so we're talking about just a uh, substantial substantially fewer um, public colleges um, would be affected by bankruptcy. The thing that got me interested in it though was that um, um, I was uh, in one of my first papers was thinking about this issue about public colleges um, and uh, saw a couple of cases that dealt with the bankruptcy of um, uh, K-12 institutions and whether um, public uh, schools, again, K-12 schools, would be able to use bankruptcy or not. And I found cases going uh, in, in both directions. Um, um, so public uh, colleges, unlike private colleges, uh, might very well need to use uh, a type of bankruptcy that we've not yet talked about. So we've talked about Chapter 7, the um, liquidation provisions. We talked about Chapter 11, the reorganization provisions uh, for business entities. Um, but uh, there's another uh, option, Chapter 9, which is for uh, municipal entities. Um, and uh, in this new paper, I make the case that, uh, that public colleges uh, might have to use or would likely have to use um, Chapter 9, uh, which is also a reorganization type provision. Why do you think that is? So, um, in the new paper, I look through the existing case law, uh, and there's just not all that much of it. Uh, municipal bankruptcies are uh, are uncommon. Um, now, you know, I know that you uh, wrote a paper in vol uh, dealing with the Detroit bankruptcy, um, which maybe some folks are, are aware of. Um, uh, Puerto Rico, um, they have um, not a bankruptcy, but they've had their own financial distress in a bankruptcy-like proceeding. Uh, Stockton, California, uh, Harrisburg, there's been a couple of um, higher-profile bankruptcies, but um, there's just not that many of them. Um, uh, and that's for two reasons, I think. Uh, one, um, because the um, uh, cities are, are sometimes just um, subdivisions of the state, um, the state sometimes uh, bails out uh, municipalities and decides um, the right option is not to put them into a bankruptcy, but to uh, to just bail them out um, um, as they don't need bankruptcy. And uh, 
Another reason is that um, because of issues relating to state sovereignty, um, that um, the federal government uh, can't force uh, subdivisions of the state to reorganize and um, uh, and instead um, states have to opt in to chapter nine and only about half of states uh, allow entities in their uh, in their state to, to use a municipal bankruptcy proceeding. Okay. Okay. So assuming you're right, which honestly, I'm inclined to think that you, you probably are given that, you know, I think the general understanding is that that public colleges are, for example, entitled to like protections from like the Eleventh Amendment, you know, state sovereign immunity and all that kind of stuff. It does seem like they would be best characterized as arms of the state. Um, if that's true, then it sounds like it might, like Chapter Nine municipal bankruptcy protection, might only be available to some small percentage of public colleges in the first place. That's right. So, you know, in the new paper, I, I look at the existing case law that defines what is a municipality and try to figure out would a public college count. Um, and my conclusion is, um, you know, under the various tests that have been articulated in the case law, often revolving uh, revolving around how much control the state has over the entity, uh, that public uh, institutions of higher education are most likely um, uh, municipalities, and therefore limited to Chapter Nine. Uh, um, and excluded entirely from Chapter 7 and excluded entirely from Chapter 11. Uh, but because only half of the states, give or take, uh, allow a uh, municipality to reorganize, that means that uh, for public colleges in half of the states, they would have uh, no access to bankruptcy at all. Right. Okay. Well, let's, if we can, like, for, to the extent that public a public college does have access to Chapter 9 bankruptcy protection. Um, as I understand it, it's quite different <laughs> than bankruptcy protection under, say, Chapter 11 reorganization. For those colleges that do have access, do you think Chapter 9 could be an effective way of sort of restructuring their operations? And would it leave them vulnerable to the same kinds of restrictions on um, the, you know, ability of students to take out federal funds, uh, that like chapter 11 would have. Uh, so I'll start with the second question. Uh, and that is yes, right. Unless the law changes, um, uh, the, and that law being the higher education act to allow colleges to access title four student loan and grant funds, uh, um, if they file for bankruptcy, bankruptcy is just a non-starter for all colleges, um, public or private. So, um, so all of this depends on on that changing. Now, the Higher Education Act is up for reauth reauthorization, and it's certainly possible that it that it will change. Um, and given that it didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense in the first instance, um, my argument is that it should change. But um, um, but that's certainly uh, the case that it would need to change. Um, um, you know, as for I think the first part of your question, I, I took that would be something like you know what. What would colleges get out of bankruptcy? Um, and, and I think there's there's a I think there's a lot that that public colleges would get out of bankruptcy, and that the, there are certainly important differences between um, chapters nine and eleven. Um, but um, in some ways, that's act, that's actually more useful for um, uh, for public colleges. So, for example, there are restrictions on the ability to terminate collective bargaining agreements in uh, Chapter 11 that are not applicable to uh, Chapter 9 bankruptcy. Um, and, you know, um, I do always fear saying this, uh, given that I, uh, I'm um, a tenured track professor, uh, but one of those things is the ability to, uh, to terminate tenured professors. Um, you know, to the extent that um, a college uh, has, um, you know, has invested in, um, I don't want to pick on any particular uh, field, but, um, you know, they have uh, 20 professors of, of basket weaving and um, we're now uh, mechanically producing baskets uh, and they've got, you know, student enrollment of, uh, of two people a year. Um, um, bankruptcy would allow 
the termination of those contracts, um, uh, you know, even if they were collectively bargained, right? And so that would, um, and there is a fair bit of collective bargaining at, um, um, at colleges of all sorts. Um, and so that's something that, uh, that municipal bankruptcy is sort of, is more generous to debtors. Um, mm. But there's all sorts of other advantages. And now a lot of them relate to, um, uh, to terminating contracts of various sorts, um, you know, whether that is uh, you want to um, shrink, for example, certain uh, sports programs, right? And so you've got um, contracts with various vendors to supply, you know, I don't know if it's a football program, pads and um, footballs and cleats and uh, other athletic wear, uh, but some of it's going to be your coaches. Um, um, some of it might be sort of um, leases on facilities to, um, um, to play or to practice on, um, right? So the bankruptcy would allow you to, um, to restructure those obligations at a much discounted price uh, relative to being outside of bankruptcy. Uh, bankruptcy, whether chapter nine or 11 allows, uh, provides for something called the automatic stay, which is a injunction uh, which prevents uh, creditors from taking action to seize, for example, uh, assets of the uh, of the bankrupt entity. Um, so Education Corporation of America, to return to them, one of these um, uh, for-profit providers that just closed, they sought a receivership because bankruptcy wasn't available to them, um, primarily because they had landlords that were threatening to evict them from their property. Mm. Right? So the stay would have allowed the uh, the entity to, uh, or the colleges to remain in possession of their campuses um, at least for a short time, while the debtor tried to figure out, like, is there a viable path forward? As it was, students showed up, found notes on the door saying the, the school is closed and it will not reopen. Um, right? And so students who were maybe going to graduate this December found out uh, just a few days ago, or in Batterat College's case today, that uh, they're not going to graduate from that school. Um, and so they're left trying to figure out, uh, what will I do? And bankruptcy just... It's not a solution for everybody, but it does give a little bit more of a runway um, in part because of the automatic stay and allows a college the opportunity to sort of step back from the creditor pressures that are hounding them and think, is there a path forward? And I think that's often the, the most important part of bankruptcy. Um, but finally, another uh, another benefit that um, would uh, be for both private and public colleges uh, would be the ability to discharge certain debt. Um, so to, um, you know, again, in Burlington College's case, right, they, they borrowed something like $11 million to buy this lakefront property. They could have sold the lakefront property and then discharged the excess debt, um, use that money to pay off creditors um, as much as they had, um, and then, you know, lease office space downtown again. Mm. Mm. So this might be kind of speculative, uh, given that it's not really currently on the table, but are there reasons why states might not want to allow public colleges to utilize Chapter 9 bankruptcy? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I think there is often a perception uh, that, um, that bankruptcy is bad and that it is um, – um, particularly in the consumer context, it was often stigmatized. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of talk uh, when GM and Chrysler were in financial distress about would anybody buy a car from a company that was in bankruptcy? And um, there was a lot of hand-wringing over this. And it turns out the answer was yes. Um, and the, 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 both of those um, companies did, uh, did substantially better, at least for a time. Um, and... Um, and so, but I could see that uh, that states would be concerned about uh, the perception of the entity being a bank uh, in bankruptcy. Um, I mean, to my mind, presumably that's why uh, a number of states don't authorize bankruptcy uh, at all for their municipalities. Um, um, and you know, whether or not the Higher Education Act changes, that would continue to be the case because of um, issues surrounding state sovereignty. Right. Right. Well, Matt, this has been a great conversation. I've learned a lot about about bankruptcy law, in especially in the higher education context. I was wondering if you had kind of any final thoughts or takeaways that listeners ought to keep in mind as they think about uh, bankruptcy policy, especially in relation to uh, institutions of higher education going forward. 
Sure. I mean, I, I, uh, I suspect that anybody who's listened to this far is already uh, particularly interested in bankruptcy uh, and so maybe knows this already. But, um, you know, I think I have to think of bankruptcy as a federal policy, uh, a solution financial, for financial distress. Um, and it's interesting to think about uh, the sort of holes in that system. Uh, you know, bankruptcy has effectively displaced a lot of state law alternatives um, because uh, it is an effective solution for many entities in bankruptcy. But um, but it is not a solution for colleges. It is not a solution for, as we saw, Puerto Rico. It is not a solution for, for example, uh, businesses that uh, that deal in or related to marijuana. Um, uh, right. So there, there's there's sort of holes in our system for dealing with financially distressed entities. And that's one of the things that interests me, particularly about um, the exclusion for colleges. Um, it is um, it is simply a, uh, we have entities that are in financial distress uh, and don't seemingly have a good path for dealing with that financial distress, even though there are these tools that are available that would uh, would benefit them, uh, and I think would also benefit um, students, communities, faculty, staff, etc. Great. Well, thanks so much, Matt. Thanks so much for talking with me. We've tripled educational aid to cities and towns. And because inflation threatens the ability of many parents to put their kids through college, we've kept state college tuitions low, and we've increased scholarships and low-interest loans. We've built a new University of Massachusetts in Boston, four new colleges, a new medical school, in all 30,000 new openings for students. And to keep schools in touch with real student needs, we've put students on all the state college boards of trustees, 